Good morning or afternoon, whatever it is. I think it's around 11 a.m. here in Singapore, uh, which means about 10 p.m. yesterday back in Dallas. So hello from the future. Uh, anyways, we are here in Singapore. I say we. It's, I always say we for some reason, but it's it's me. I'm in Singapore right now, uh, and I'm in front of a place called Lao Passat. Now, Lao Passat is one of the uh, food stall kind of malls. Imagine like in the U.S. you have a like a food court at a mall. Well, this is kind of the same thing. It's, it's all outdoors, open air. Uh, and so if you look back this way, you'll see all these various food stalls, but it's any kind of genre of food you can imagine. It's not just Asian food. You have your uh, Malaysian food, your, your Singapore food, your Chinese food, your Thai food, but then you have like a vegetarian pizza place in it as well. So uh, really, really cool to eat here. Uh, you will notice as I give you a little tour of Singapore that I'm going to get progressively sweatier and sweatier. Uh, Singapore is quite hot. Um, so it's probably around 90 degrees right now for those of you in Fahrenheit land, probably 30, 31 degrees Celsius for those of you uh, abroad like myself. Um, but the humidity is just un unbelievable. It's uh, to best equate it, like stand outside and have somebody throw a bucket of water on you, and that's kind of what it feels like walking around in Singapore. Uh, but I want to give you a, a little tour of the Singapore that I know. I don't claim to know everything about Singapore. Uh, for a brief spell, I was going to be living in Singapore. Obviously, that has not happened yet, and it's quite a long story. Anyways, so the food stalls are part of the heritage of Singapore. Uh, for a couple of bucks, you can grab some great food. It may not be the healthiest food. It's always going to taste great. So anyways, uh, let's go from here. We are on the kind of near the central area of Singapore. We're going to go over this way to the Marina Bay Sands area. Okay, so now I'm at Raffles Key. And this you'll see the little building or the little sculpture right there. And then behind that is an area called Raffles Place. Now, in case you're zooming in, you can see it says Q-U-A-Y. It's Raffles Q-U-A-Y. It's actually pronounced key, uh, just like it is in Australia New Zealand, for those of you who have been. Um, so anyways, uh, you're going to see the name Raffles popping up over and over again. And it really goes back to the history of Singapore itself, uh, why the name Raffles is so significant. So way back in probably uh, the 1200s, uh, there was a sultan who was part of a kingdom uh, who wanted to put a fishing village somewhere and he was offshore and he saw a lion on the shore and in Sanskrit that word is Singapura which means the lion city and that's how Singapore gets its name and that's why it's still referred to as the lion city today and you'll see things like the the merlion uh, being a part of kind of Singapore mythology. Well anyways so from 1200 until 18, the early 1800s uh, Singapore kind of changed hands quite a few times and then in uh, well I guess in 1509 is when Portugal uh, really started to make a big push into colonizing kind of Southeast Asia uh, after Portugal well the, you know the Great Britain was involved as well uh, as was the Dutch as were the Dutch uh, and so the Great Britain had control over India with the East India Company uh, and the Dutch had uh, big shipping channels as well. Uh, well, anyways, there were uh, quite a few people who wanted Great Britain to have a bigger standing in the region because uh, the Dutch were apparently putting pressure on the British uh, with all sorts of fees and taxes and all sorts of stuff like that. So you can already see the sweat is kicking in. But anyways, so the, uh, there, the, the British, uh, there was a guy in, in, in Britain or kind of New Britain, um, his name was Stamford Raffles, Sir Stamford Raffles. And so what Raffles did is he took a couple boats and he went basically on a little uh, scouting party around the uh, Straits of Malacca. And at the southern tip of what is now known as the Malaysian Peninsula, he found a small fishing village. And that fishing village was actually very close to a very deep natural harbor. Uh, and it was actually also a very forested area for things like repairing ships and things like you know, other stuff related to the shipping industry. So he thought that would be a good place to set up a port. And in doing so, he gave Great Britain a claim to the southern part of the Malaysian Peninsula and the Straits of Malacca and that whole area. So he set that up and at the time, the village that he was looking at that was kind of next to this port had 1,000 people in it. Three years later, there were 100,000 people because the port being so naturally deep 
uh, made it easy uh, for ships to come in. And it was a free port as well, so they did not charge uh, porting fees or anything like that like the Dutch did. Um, the government of Britain and the Malaysian consulate person, uh, they eventually struck a deal. And eventually, by 1824, Singapore uh, was under British rule. And Singapore was under British rule all the way up until 1942, when it was taken over by the Japanese. And then in 1945, obviously, uh, it was taken away from the Japanese after World War II. And then they, um, it was under the control of Malaysia, I believe. No, it wasn't. It was just part of, I think it was a British protectorate. In 1964, it became part of Malaysia. But due to cultural differences and things like that, in 1965, it became its own country. Uh, and so they celebrated their 50th year as a country uh, last year, in 2015. Uh, so it's a very, fairly recently uh, organized country, but in the 1970s they took on this big modernization program uh, to build, to be an international finance center for the region, as well as a big shipping uh, port as well. You know, Port of Singapore is back behind the camera now, one of the busiest in the world. Uh, but it's also a tourism draw, and we'll get to the touristy things uh, here in a second. But Again, you will see raffles, the name raffles, all over the place. It really does surprise me that people don't say, hey, how the raffles are you doing to other people because of how prominent that name is in Singaporean culture. All right, up next, let's head to the bay. Okay, so I need to apologize for that last clip. I'm trying to make sure my backpack doesn't fall off into Marina Bay behind me. Uh, for whatever reason, whenever I wear sunglasses, my camera does not recognize my face, so it cannot autofocus on it. Although what's behind me is way more interesting anyways, um, but that's okay. So, over here, you see the Marina Bay Sands, one of the most famous casinos in the world. And it's really turned into one of the, the highlights of the Singapore skyline, one of the most recognized things about Singapore. Um, it's not an understatement to say that it is absolutely massive. The, the land that it's on, which was like reclaimed land from the landfill, even as reclaimed land, it cost like a billion dollars. And it's not just the casino, it's everything you see down here. Uh, so they have convention space, the, the hotel itself, and then they have the big uh, sky deck is what they call it on top, which is one of the big tourist attractions of Singapore. Now, it's kind of hard to get a sense of scale of being across a bay from it. And actually, if you look real close, I think they had the Singapore premiere of Ghostbusters uh, last night. So you can see Ghostb Ghostbusters written in a little white print there. Anyway, so each one of those towers is 58 stories tall. So they have 2,156 rooms. They have uh, seven restaurants from, you know, celebrity chefs from all around the world. Uh, and then on the sky deck, that can hold up to 3,900 people. And at the front of the sky deck, closest to the camera, you've probably seen pictures from it, they have an infinity pool, uh, which is awesome because you can just look across the entirety of Singapore uh, from Marina Bay Sands. So over here in the front, you'll see uh, they have a Louis Vuitton store, the biggest Louis Vuitton boutique in the world. And then back over here, what looks like a little clamshell or flower petal lotus kind of thing, uh, that is the Art and Science Museum here in Singapore. So they also have a performance hall. Uh, they have concerts, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and so this whole area has kind of been transformed because of the Marina Bay Sands. Now it opened, uh, finally, like the full-on grand opening was in 2011, but the uh, casino and the property was supposed to be done in 2009, but there was kind of a global financial crisis around then. So it got delayed a little bit, but finally everything opened up in 2011, and that's so significant in terms of revenue for Singapore's government. It's actually worth, like, Half a percent of Singapore's GDP is that building right there. So it's absolutely crazy. It is not cheap to stay there. Uh, it is not cheap to gamble there. Uh, so if you're a native Singaporean, you actually have to pay a 100 Singapore dollars, about 75 US dollars, uh, $100 fee to get into the casino because they want to discourage Singaporeans gambling, but they'll let Americans gamble or foreigners gamble all day long. Uh, so anyways, the casino is kind of at the bottom center and they also have, you know, everywhere in Singapore has a mall. Uh, there are malls kind of out the wazoo, uh, and they, have, they all have the same stores, but whereas we see like a Starbucks in every corner uh, back in the States, here they have a Rolex store on every corner, a Cartier store on every corner, a Hermes store on every, on every single corner, uh, and that's what's kind of underneath the Marina Bay Sands. Now, on the other side of Marina Bay Sands is a place called Gardens by the Bay, where I went to in January or February when I was here. I may try to get over there today. I'm not sure. Um, I, I guess the next priority for me right now is finding some shade 
and a cold beverage. So that means I'll probably go to a Starbucks just like I would in the States. Not that adventurous. But anyways, we'll uh, check in soon. All right, so this little guy right here is called the Merlion. It's kind of the icon of Singapore. Now, if you remember from earlier uh, when the gentleman saw a lion on the shore of Singapore and called the city Singapura, which is Sanskrit for Lion City, uh, the Merlion is kind of the symbol of Singapore. You'll see it on all of their uh, all the little souvenirs. You see it on all the, like official government stuff. And it's you know Singapore is still known as the Lion City today, kind of for this reason. So they have this Merlion statue just shooting water all over the place. And actually, it used to be a little bit further away, but this little bridge or this little river right here, this body of water is actually it's the Singapore River and it empties out here into Marina Bay. So when uh, the Marina Bay Sands and that whole business started getting going, and they built this little esplanade around here, uh, the Merlion actually ended up being kind of behind it, and they really wanted it being at the entrance of the Singapore River, so uh, they moved it here, and then the water pump shooting water out of the mouth had been um, damaged or something like that since like 1998. So new water pump with a redundant water pump to ensure that water is always blowing out of the mouth of the merlion because when you think of a lion you think water shooting out of its mouth and so not just that but you can see kind of all the tourists around here um, very similar to like the leaning tower of pisa you'll have people like getting like that to make it look like the water is going into their mouth i don't know uh, it's a statue of water shooting out of it so whatever so anyways uh, real quick before we move on to our next location, I do want to show you this. Uh, so, I don't know if you can see this. I'll try to zoom in where I can, but there's something going on with Ghostbusters. You can see right here that there's Ghostbusters written there. And I thought like the premiere had been last night because it was a Saturday, but now they have like the marshmallow guys kind of come into the picture here. So, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should walk over, see if we can get some... Uh, or at least see what we can figure out with the Ghostbuster shot. Um, anyways, I, before we get going again, I do want to point out just some of the architecture you'll see around Singapore. So Tokyo, I found, is a city that has a lot of rectangles in it. Uh, it's, it's really a kind of a bore, it's boring architecturally, and Singapore is not like that at all. So Singapore, you see this building over here. Uh, you, just, you see all sorts of interesting designs uh, around Singapore. And so... That's on one side, so you can see a lot of diversity in the architecture. And then if you turn the camera this way, point it up a little bit, so this is more like the central bis business district of Singapore. So you have like the Marina Bay Financial Center this way, and then the rest of the uh, buildings are over this way. But you can really see the uh, kind of the architectural diversity when you look at Singapore versus these other places. So it's, uh, I don't know. It's pretty nice, at least uh, it's different from Tokyo where everything is just different versions of the, uh, of the same rectangle, you know, to it being a city of rectangles. So anyways, let's go to our next location, which is... So real quickly, I've heard some feedback from a couple of people. They're always curious about why I seem to be wearing Texas A&M gear in like all of my videos, especially when I'm abroad. And perfect example of why it just happened. So I uh, was sitting in, sitting in the Starbucks for you know, a little while, catching up actually on an A&M baseball game taking place you know, back in the States. Uh, and a gentleman asked me, hey, did you go to Texas A&M? I said, sure did. It turns out he was an Auburn fan from Birmingham, Alabama. Actually played college baseball himself. Ended up having a great conversation for like an hour. So the reason I always love wearing A&M stuff, if nothing else, it gives like... Uh, I don't know, the, the, the chance for these kind of such a small world kind of connections to happen. So anyways, just wanted to point that out that A, granted most of the non-business clothing I own is A&M branded, so it makes it kind of easy because I'm a pretty proud Aggie, but just wanted to, it goes to show, you know, the A&M stuff works, ends up with some great conversations. So Brandon, it was great meeting you. Okay, so I'm here in one of Singapore's many underpasses and pedestrian kind of centers. Now, I have a weird thing. Whenever I go to a new location, I always try to figure out, you have to bear with me, I, I try to figure out what the living room of the culture is. Where do people gather? Where do people break bread together? Um, where do people commune? Uh, and it's actually very similar to Dubai, I think, for Singapore. Uh, it's anywhere that there's air conditioning. So you don't find a lot of people outside. You don't find a lot of shops on the street front. 
But under, like, we're under one of the main intersections in Singapore right now. This is where you find, like, these pedestrian malls, these underpass malls with Burger Kings and Swinsons and all sorts of random American fast food. Uh, but that's where people dine because it is air-conditioned, and it is so great because it is so hot outside. Uh, so anyways, that's good. And, and that's why you find so many malls in Singapore as well. And people just walk the malls all day because it is so hot outside. Okay, really getting warm now. Uh, so it turns out that little mall I was just in under the street was called Raffles City because like I mentioned, everything is about Raffles in Singapore. This building behind me right here is the world famous Raffles Hotel. Uh, it is built obviously in honor of Sir Stamford Raffles. A couple of unique things about it. One, it's unbelievably expensive. The cost in US dollars usually anywhere between $500 and $1,000 a night to stay here. Uh, supposedly it's pretty nice. I've never been inside of it. Uh, but it's also home to the Long Bar. Now, the Long Bar is where they invented Singapore's famous drink, the Singapore Sling. Now, if you've never had a Singapore Sling, uh, imagine taking all the fruit punch concentrate in the world, putting it into a glass, and then adding some booze to it. Uh, so it's not hard to make. You can look up the recipe online. Uh, if you go to the Long Bar, the home of the Sling, to get a Sling, it's going to cost you about 25 US dollars. Uh, because like most things in Singapore, drinking is very expensive here. Um, so I don't recommend getting a Singapore sling here. I certainly never have. Uh, you can also get them all around Singapore for far cheaper. But if you want to say I had one at the home of the Singapore sling, Raffles Hotel is where to go. And I think this is going to wrap up our little tour of Singapore um, because quite frankly, it's getting way too hot outside. Uh, so I'm going to go grab iced coffee relax for a bit, maybe head back to the hotel, uh, re recharge the batteries, and then meeting up with some friends later tonight for dinner and, uh, and, a, and a beer or two, and then back into the office tomorrow. So hope you've enjoyed it. May get out and shoot a little more. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, Tour Guide Andy signing off.